Excellent. Thank you very much for still being here. Uh, we've been powering through the day, and uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for the, to Isabel and Lucy for the invitation, of course, and for everybody being here. Uh, the name, the title of my talk um, is Entre Gustos No Hay Disgustos, on Tania Bruguera's Bogotá, untitled 2009, Disgust and the Uncanny. Um, but before we actually go into the talk, I want to show a video of the work that I will talk about on Title Bogotá 2009, but not the artist recording, but was, was shown in the Colombian news. So bear with me, bear with the Spanish um, for a couple of minutes. <laughs> That's Tori Salcedo, by the way. Untitled Bogotá 2009 was produced for the 7th Encuentro of the Hemispheric Institute of Performance and Politics held in Bogotá, Colombia. For this work, the Cuban artist Tania Bruguera arranged for four ex-victims of the Colombian armed conflict, a paramilitary soldier, an ex-guerrilla member, an internal refugee, and a victim of the violence, to sit in the same room, which was a big deal to begin with, and then to discuss what the notion of the hero meant for the Colombian context immersed in continuous political and violent turmoil. Whilst they were trying to address a packed auditorium inside Bogotá's Universidad Nacional, one of Bruguera's assistants, as Helene Posner notes, started wading through the audience bearing a tray lined with cocaine for the audience's consumption. Although noticed at the beginning, the tray of cocaine quickly became the audience's main focus of attention, overtaking the important discussion happening right in front of them. As the video that we just saw uh, demonstrates, many of the audience members indulged in the local delicacy and inhaled the cocaine. Others, such as the renowned artist Doris Salcedo, who we see um, in the video, um, abruptly left the room clearly disgusted by the action. Others vociferously cried for Bruguera's head. The work concluded when an anonymous witness called the police to the university and reported a crime. 
At this stage, Bruguera took the microphone and thanked all of the Colombians that had attended the event. When watching the video documentation for this piece, one of the most evident things for us to see is the quick, sudden, and powerful polarization of the audience, triggered by the introduction of the dust. As soon as the audience realized the drug's presence, at least three groups were consolidated. Those who engaged in the, in the drug and gustaron, those who frantically started to record and document the consumers, and those who immediately raised their opinions and rejected the work. Contrary to many artworks where there is a purported need to mend or ameliorate social bonds or create moments of conviviality for the creation of a community, uh, for example, Nicolas Bourriot's uh, Relational Aesthetics or Grant Kester's Dialogical Aesthetics, Untitled Bogota 2009 successfully and effectively tore the Colombian audience into distinct groups. For those who actively participated in the, uh, in the work, snorted the drug, Bruguera's work was perhaps not very different from private parties, vernissages, or even gallery or museum openings. For those who negatively participated in it, that is, actively criticized the work and the artist, Bruguera had missed the point of the Colombian conflict and had only uh, addressed stereotypical notions about the nation. Many critical assess assessments circulated soon after the work. Within a couple of days, artists and critics alike scorned the work and the artist and declared her vision as superficial, reductive, and offensive. For these critics, Untitled Bogota 2009 resorted to the formulaic description of the Colombian conflict as fueled by drugs, and therefore simplified very complex relationships of, for example, poverty and violence, lack of basic education, lack of presence of the state, undemocratic political practices, extreme corruption, and other malaises that also drive the current Colombian state of affairs. The war triggered a very strange response in the Colombian public sphere as it encouraged consensus between the liberal artistic sectors and the conservative Colombian government insofar as both groups, the offended, the disgusted, disappointed artists and critics and conservative politicians agreed in their total and visceral rejection of the artwork. In the immediate aftermath of Ontario Bogota 2009, the Colombian Ministry of Culture threatened Bruguera with a full investigation into how public funds were used in her work, demanding to know if there was any chance that public funds were used uh, for the purchase of the drug. The critics also rallied against the artist on the basis that the performance had taken place in an educational institution and had depicted the Universidad Nacional unfavorably, as a place that, if it did not encourage drug consumption, at least did not enforce an ant a strict anti-drug policy. Clearly, Untitled Bogota 2009 did not please the majority of the audience. As such, the work did not fulfill the audience's expectations as perhaps, as the title of a review of the exhibition suggests, entitled The Fall of the Goddess, it even disappointed many participants. In an interview with Bruguera, critic Pablo España argued that untitled Bogota 2009, and this is where I subscribe to his reading, Contrary to the aforementioned opinions, touched a very sensitive fiber in the Colombian audience. For him, and I quote, the work unleashed a Freudianly repressed contact in the psyche of the Colombian subject, that the traffic and consumption of cocaine determines the Colombian political situation. This, uh, end quote. This stereotype has circulated through Hollywood movies and it's manifest in the kinds of questions that Colombians are often asked abroad whether they belong to a particular cartel, if they have any drugs to sell, or the more abstract Colombia Escobar commentary. This notion has been thoroughly ingrained in the imaginary of Colombia, both at home and abroad. At the same time, the production and circulation of cocaine as an industry has been responsible directly through the conflict and indirectly through a drug overdose and so on for thousands of deaths in the country. It constantly contributes to a cycle of violence and forced displacement that has eroded the agricultural power of the nation through its violence and severely traumatized the collective memory of the country. According to España's interpretation and my own, Untitled Bogota 2009 glaringly, violently confirmed and confronted the stereotype, triggering a strong reaction from the public. Ontario Bogota 2009 made evident very important tensions and disagreements that, within the Colombian context, 
are usually ignored because of their overexposure. Cocaine production is not a new issue for Colombian society, nor is Bruguera the first artist or artwork to tackle the role that the substance has played in the history of Colombian society. From local critiques, such as Miguel Angel Rojas' work, to more international interventions, such as pop, pop, um, popular cultural products like Clear and Present Danger in the 80s and some other bad movies. Cocaine has pervaded the reality and the unconscious of the Colombian subject, again, both at home and abroad. This is not to say, however, that cocaine as a product, as the stimulant, the powdered dust that we see here, is everywhere in the country. On the contrary, although usually the product, the cocaine, is itself absent, exported, the implications of its existence and circulation are permanently felt through shipment detentions, cartel violence, corruption, and perhaps more importantly through the perpetuation of an internal conflict. Although cocaine might not be an object in the everyday lives of many Colombians, the fact that it sustains a parallel economy that in turn finances small private armies, payment for corrupt officials, and even football teams effectively shapes the everyday and foreseeable future of the country. So Ontario Bogotá operated upon the political imaginary in Colombia in several ways. In the first instance, and contrary to how cocaine circulates in the Colombian debate, as I'm saying mainly through its absence, as implication and not as object, the introduction of cocaine of the dust in Tyro Bogota 2009 emphasized the actual presence, the materiality and physicality of the product over the coca leaf. Perhaps paradoxically, it can be argued that the introduction of the cocaine reversed the terms of the discussion of its role within the Colombian uh, political reality, insofar as it highlighted its ubiquitous presence. Therefore, the dust becoming an index of the socioeconomic conflict and not the other way around, where the socioeconomic conflict, excuse me, is understood as an implication of the production of cocaine. In this sense, the cocaine acted as a mnemonic trace of a repressed, or more better described as latent content, a return of the expunged absent, ab, um, excuse me, a return of the uh, expunged um, absent object that has dictated the reality of the country through its spectral um, appearances. Like a materialized ghost, the presence of the cocaine affected the collective of, of conscience of the auditorium and triggered a series of strong reactions and fragmentations of the audience, as we saw. Furthermore, as Bruguera herself notes, the cocaine trumped the panel discussion that was the original reason for the event. The fact that the cocaine being passed around completely obscured the presence and the discourse of victims of the Colombian conflict it speaks volumes of how, in the Colombian collective imaginary, the actual violence is repressed and disregarded in favor of discussions about the object of cocaine. It clearly made evident that in the present historical conditions of the Colombian conflict, it is impossible to have a discussion about what Bruguera calls the conditions of emergence of a hero, as this debate was not only framed, but ultimately trumped and stopped by cocaine, the product and its trafficking, its business. Activating a series of repressed memories of the connection between the object of cocaine and the political violence of the country, Untitled Bogota 2009 articulated an aesthetics of the uncanny that sought to explore a moment perhaps before moral judgment, a moment of confusion and condensation triggered by the appearance of a mnemonic trace, in this case the cocaine, which only later produces this uh, strong disgust um, towards the action. The white dust, so ubiquitous in the Colombian discourse through implications, was made present in the space of this talk in order to elicit a response. The work, however, did not fall into a moralizing discourse that either condemned the consumers or producers, nor did it offer an opinion or a solution as to how to solve the internal conflict, which I think is what a lot of audience members are troubled with. On the opposite, Ontario Bogotá turned the familiar, both the cocaine, the dust, and its role in the Colombian political imaginary, strange, by operating and deterring it from the inside. The work confronted the local audience with their own reality, which has been, by virtue of its ubiquitousness, rendered almost transparent. As the video documentation that we just saw, the work unleashed a collective sense of anxiety, and I would actually characterize it as disgust 
by turning what is familiar, the discourse of the object of cocaine, strange. Thank you. Short and stuff. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if it was categorically proven that the powder was cocaine, and indeed if it matters. It, I, I, I think it does matter because I, I, I know that Bruguera had asked for a gun and cocaine to the organizers of the event, and they out, you know, out very straightforward said, no, you're crazy. So for a while, they balanced the idea of, of having um, harina. Uh, how do you translate? Um, uh, flour, yes, thank you, flour, uh, to pass around uh, sort of a fake uh, no, cocaine. And this is how the work was approved by the organizing committee, using flour. But the night before or the day before, right before the work opened, Bruguera, without telling anybody in, of the organizer committee and making use of her local contacts, uh, managed to get her hands on a very good amount of cocaine. Because if I'm not wrong, that tray went around three or four times during the event. Um, but this was unbeknownst either to the organizers or to the, very, to the audience members um, that, that were there until they actually saw people doing it. And then if there's a longer video documentation of the work where you can hear people chattering to each other asking, is, is, it, is it real? Is it good? Um, and then a lot of the answers is, oh yeah, it's good, it's Colombian. <laughs> Uh, that's just to say that um, I think it did matter that it was an actual, uh, that it was actually cocaine, uh, and it was. I I don't know what what I usually think about, in, in particular in the dust and the uncanny, is uh, the Sandman and the story of the Sandman that comes to take away your eyes with the sort of burning coal that basically uh, renders you blind. Um, that's what I really think in terms of a, a sort of a very visual association, right, between this dust and uh, Freud's and the uncanny and uh, the Sandman. I think there's some work to be done in, in that respect, perhaps, in that sort of literal uh, dust and dust. I was wondering too that another dimension of the disgust and the people who left the room particularly was just some sense of having been having been deceived and that there was an air created through the event of kind of reconciliation of something being by assembling different people involved um, in the, the civil war in Colombia that there was a sense in which she was creating an event that that was performing some kind of reconciliation, and it was, it's about that subject as much as the attention that the cocaine took away from it. It's about being set up, I guess, which perhaps they should have expected given the artist involved, but whether part of that outrage was, especially by someone who is not from Colombia as well, and I think there's like the fact of her being a foreigner also, I, and I messing with this. that was a big this. deal. Um, the fact that she was from Cuba, and that it wasn't a local sort of commentary, um, it, it, it still matters a lot, I think, in the Colombian context, and issues of legitimacy over who can have the right to say what about the Colombian conflict, really, and the violence in the place are very, um, I, I don't know, I guess us Colombians are very sort of jealous about it, and we don't really, we don't like other people talking about uh, our dirty business. Well, but if, I, I actually don't think that the work was presenting this reconciliation thing um, at all, especially given that um, on the actual day of the event, it was publicized that there was going to be four panelists, a paramilitary guy, an ex-paramilitary guy, an ex-guerrilla member, uh, a victim of the conflict, and a displaced person. Well, it so happened that the paramilitary guy didn't go because he was afraid, because Universidad Nacional is characteristically sort of left-winged and has been associated in the past with the FARC, which is the rebel force that are usually in confrontation with the paramilitary, so on and so forth. So the guy was actually, literally, and for a paramilitary guy to be scared to go anywhere. Um, it, it sort of means that there are ideological and problems of reconciliation that are not 
we're not even near getting to talk about them. Um, so I personally wouldn't see this reconciliatory aim behind it. Um, I think on the opposite, it, it, it just, the work proved that reconciliation is impossible right now because we're still, for very good reasons, caught up with the object and its traffic. That, just to say that I'm not very optimistic about the peace dialogues. But. Oh, but this is on the internet, so I shouldn't be saying that. <laughs> Um, uh, soon after the work was over, um, because the police came in, and um, so she just she left. I think she left Colombia the next day or two days after, and she hasn't been back. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think she'll be back anytime soon. <laughs> I doubt it. Thank you. Thank you.